I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all this is going to be part one of a little series of deep dives we are currently embarking on. We talk a lot about Sister Wives, the show on TLC, yada yada, we already know. The Brown family in general. We have done short little deep dives on some of the family members, but one question that until today has remained unanswered. What exactly does Cody Brown believe in, and what has he instilled the family to believe in? You get what I'm saying? Before we go any further... Welcome back or welcome to my channel. I don't know how you got here, but I am so glad you're here. I hope you stick around and smash that subscribe button before the end of this video. And also click the little bell beside subscribe to all. That way you'll be notified whenever YouTube sends out notifications. Please like and share this video. Also comment your thoughts and opinions. I love hearing and reading what all of you have to say about all of these topics, so don't forget to drop a comment below. Cody Brown's nephew is a popular TikToker. Benjamin Brown is the son of Cody's brother. He talks about growing up on the Brown family ranch in Wyoming. Finally, we have an insider. Yes, you know I've been looking for that. And when I tell y'all this is fascinating understatement complete understatement i will attach the links to this podcast we will be reacting to today as well as benjamin's tiktok so you can go follow both remember this is part one of a multiple part series i will post part two later today so make sure you're subscribed and have that little bell click to all the little bell beside subscribe Click it. Be sure it's clicked to all. That way you'll be notified. Okay. Without further ado, here is Benjamin Brown, Cody Brown's nephew. Y'all, trigger warning. He talks about some serious stuff. Okay, let's just get into it. Ben, I'm so excited to have you on. Can you say hello? Oh my gosh, Lindsay, I'm so excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Okay, so you're kind of a TikTok breakout star. It, it's funny because... <laughs> I had, oh golly, I had probably like five or six people send me your TikTok videos after. Oh, under really? Heaven. Yeah, you were doing Under the Banner of Heaven reviews and everyone's like, you got to talk to this guy. Oh yeah, yeah. That's been really fun. Let's get into it. Let's talk about who you are and what your story is because you have kind of a fascinating story. So I want, I want to back up at the very beginning. Tell us your sort of Mormon bona fides. That's what that's what we like. Okay, to yeah, I I can I can give you my Mormon uh, royalty, and I I come from I come from good Mormon stock. Uh, so my my great I don't even know how many my great something several se somethings grandfather was a dude named Ebenezer Brown, and he joined the Mormon in like 1834, and so he was like hardcore right at the very beginning, and then he. But what's interesting, so so the, the, the thing that's kind of unique about me right now is that I come from a Mormon polygamous background. That that's a little bit different from kind of 90% of Mormons are not are not really associated with polygamy at all. So that's kind of one of the interesting things about my story, but that started way back then. So Ebenezer Brown was not only one of the first first people to join the church, he was also one of the first people to practice polygamy. And him and like his descendants, they did that basically down until the LDS church stopped practicing polygamy in 1890. So like they came West, they like Ebenezer Brown went with the Mormon battalion. We hear a lot about that at like family reunions. And then my family, when, when the LDS church stopped practicing plural marriage in like 1890, uh, my family stopped doing it too. So they kind of went with the, the LDS church. And when the polygamists were sort of breaking off at that point, they didn't go with the polygamists. They went with the LDS church. They were LDS for like the next hundred years, right? So into the modern era, right up until my uh, dad. And my dad, he did some studying and actually was introduced to him by his mom. So it was like his parents and him, when, when he was an adult, they started uh, researching the, the deeper doctrines of the church. And they looked around and they looked at the church that they were in right then, which was the modern you know, uh, LDS church in the late 80s. Uh, which is actually kind of fascinating because it's the LDS church 
that you guys portray so well in Under the Banner of Heaven, like that's the world that my family lived in. And then they started studying the deeper mysteries and they were like, oh, the current LDS church doesn't look anything like what we find when we read the deeper doctrines, right? When we actually look at what Joseph Smith said and actually look at what Brigham Young said, the LDS church doesn't do a whole bunch of those things. And one of the most you know, prime examples of that was polygamy. And so they were like, okay, we have to live polygamy. That's commanded by God. And so they started looking around, trying to find the authority to practice polygamy. And they, they thought that they found it in the, what, what was called the Apostolic United Brethren, which is, is shortened by the AUB. Um, and that's what, that's one of the bigger sects of uh, Mormon polygamy. It's, it's kind of like right underneath the FLDS. And they joined that before I was born. And when my dad joined, he, when he was like looking, he had a fiance and they, he, she converted too. And then they also felt at the same time that they were supposed to find like another wife before uh, they got married. And so uh, they went to college. And when they were at college, my dad portrayed himself as a single man. And he went and he dated, like he went to like the singles ward in the LDS church and he found my mom and she was 19. He was 26. And he kind of like swept her off her feet and then told her that he was part of this secret inner group of the true LDS church. And did she want to be a part of that? And of course she did because everyone wants to be part of the, of the inner ring. And she'd been raised in Mormonism her whole life where, she, where it had been really commonly taught that eventually uh, we were going to live polygamy again. And so she was like, this makes sense. I've now been chosen by, because I'm so righteous <laughs> to join a polygamous family. So I'm going to do that. And when she did that, she was like cut off from her family. So fast, fast forward, I'm born um, in Mormon polygamy and I'm, and it, and, and like a couple of years after I'm born, like I'm born in, in Montana and my dad and my mom and my other mom all kind of like bounce around for a little bit. And then they end up on a ranch on my family's ranch in Wyoming. And, and that's where, so when I tell people that I grew up on a Mormon polygamous compound, what I'm talking about is there's a ranch in Wyoming that was five miles outside of town. And we had a bunch of trailers on that ranch and, and it was a bunch of polygamous and there were kids and we just like hung out on the ranch all the time. You said Montana, were you up in Pinesdale with the AUB? Where, yeah. Where you? Okay. So the, not, not actually. So, so I can get kind of specific. So, cause you, you know this. <laughs> so yeah. So Pinesdale is part of the AUB. My family was in Billings. And they were just kind of like there for, they were there for, for work for like a year. And then they ended up in Wyoming and they kind of became the, the focal point there. There's a big AAUB branch in Wyoming. There's probably right now around, there's probably around 150 people. And, and my, my parents were sort of the, the focal point of that. Okay. So in Billings, that's, that's interesting. And this highlights something that I've been trying to tell people on the podcast. More polygamists are everywhere. Yes. They're compound everywhere. Here. Yeah, there are these like concentrations of it, but really, I mean, you you guys are just living your life in Billings. Let's start there. So, uh, in Billings, how would people have experienced uh, your family? Would did they seem normal? Did they live in a normal house? What was that like? So no, so we we lived in a we lived in a trailer park, and we my my parents lived in one trailer. So th this was when I was very young. I was like a, I was like a, just a little baby. But at that point, the way that they sort of portrayed themselves to the world is they didn't really want people to know that they were polygamist. And so they, but, but they were also like, they did live, I'm sure their neighbors saw stuff, but like when dad went to work, he probably, he would, he would have my mom as his official wife. And when they would like go on vacation, there's actually this story that they tell that, that is uh, kind of funny. It actually is. I think it's pretty funny. I have to be careful because I've done, I've done a significant amount of trauma therapy and that all started because I would tell people things that I thought were funny, but actually weren't. But I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to tell you is actually funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when we were very little, um, so my, my dad had, uh, I'm my, my mom's oldest and my dad got married to my mom and my other mom right at the same time. And they had kids right at the same time. So my, my, I have a brother who's 13 days older than me. He's basically my twin, right? And uh, which is actually kind of funny because we were, bo were both Gem Geminis. So like we actually are twins, which is kind of hilarious. But uh, we would go, we went to like a, on a family vacation to like Yellowstone. And the whole family was like me, my, my brother, I'm like six months old. 
my dad, his two wives, and then my other mom's older, older son from another marriage. And we're like walking around old faithful. And my dad has both of like, has me and has my brother Ammon. Right. So it looks, he's holding two babies. We're, we're basically twins. Right. And he's getting just like all of this attention from these people who are like, Oh my God, they're so cute. Like, are they twins? And my dad has this really interesting relationship with the truth where if it's, if it's like letting someone believe that you can, that you're, uh, that you have the authority to like baptize them into a secret LDS polygamous cult, he'll like let you believe that even though he doesn't. But if he, if someone asks you if your babies are twins and they're not, he's not going to tell a lie. And so like my moms are like, he should, he should say yes, that they're twins because otherwise they're going to know that we're polygamous. And, and my dad's like, no, well, they're 13 days apart. And then all, all of the women around are, are just like, grown. they're like, oh my God, because apparently they all thought that it was one mom who'd been in labor for 13 days. Like this right. one woman like put her hand on her belly and was like, I was in labor for 12 hours. I can't imagine 13 days. <laughs> okay. That is a funny story. Uh, Guys, uh, move from Billings to Wyoming. So talk about, talk about the good old home compound. Okay. So the good old home compound. Um, so that, that all is sort of revolving around a, an attempt by my family to live the United order. Right. So one of the things about fundamentalist Mormons, where, wherever they come from is that like, if they're FLDS or AUB or just like, they're just doing their own thing is they're all trying to live this, this pure and original form of Mormonism that they believe that the real church, that the LDS church has fallen away from. And so a lot of that is polygamy, but another big one for the AUB and especially for my family is this idea of the United Order, which is essentially that it's essentially like Christian communism, right? It's the idea that we're all going to work together as a, as a, as a Mormon community and we're going to hold property in common and we're going to build each other up. We're going to take care of each other. And so my family initially moved to Wyoming. We initially ended up in Riverton where we moved on to like a dairy farm with another kind of smaller group of, of uh, members of the AUB. And we, they like tried to make a United Order thing kind of go there. I don't know what happened. All I know is that it didn't work. And so at that point they left Riverton and they moved back up to my family's ranch in Wyoming. So that ranch had been there. That's been in the family for like a hundred years. So in, in like 18, Oh geez, probably like 18 something like 1897 or something. Uh, another Ebenezer Brown uh, descendant. He was asked by the prophet of the, he was one of like the, uh, he was a one a mission that was sent out. You know how Brigham Young was like sending people out to populate different places. He went, got sent up to help, start start a town called Lovell in uh in Wyoming and he's got this ranch and that's where my family grew up and so we were I mean when we moved out when we moved out there there were probably there was like my grandpa and his three wives and my dad and his two wives and then sometimes there would be other members of my dad's family who would move back in with with various numbers of like children or wives but any at any time it was probably it was probably 20 or 30, like 20 to 30 people. And about half of those people were kids. And we just, and there, there were various degrees, right? So, so like my, my, my grandpa, my grandma and her kids, they, some of them would go to high school. So they would like leave and go out and go to high school. But my family didn't, my family didn't go to elementary school. We didn't go to school at all. We very rarely went into town. We had church in like another, another polygamous neighbor's garage. And so the world that I grew up in was really, really small. It was, it was like May tops 50 people. And the only real interaction I had with the outside world is that a couple, like a couple times a month, my mom would take me into the, the library and we would, I would like be able to check out some books and we'd like kind of, I'd, I'd see the town, right. I'd see at the stoplight, we'd like go to the store, but it was always very like the energy of it was be quiet, be sneaky don't be seen because if people notice you, then they might ask questions. And if they ask questions, they might find out that we're polygamist. And if they find out that we're polygamist, they might take you away from us. And we don't want that to happen. So we need to just kind of like fly under the radar. Don't be noticed. Don't be seen. And that was the energy that I grew up kind of feeling towards the outside world is 
the outside world is scary. The outside world is, is evil. And it's actually after us, right? It's not even just a benign, like, it's like evil out there. Like it's evil and it's coming to get us if we're not careful. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Did, when was your earliest conception or moment when you knew that you were different? Than yeah. Other- so, yeah. So at one point we, we went to, I can't remember exactly how old I was because I don't have good, like, I, I, I don't, I assume that other people, they kind of remember things in like grades, like this happened in first grade or this happened in, you know, sixth grade or whatever. And I don't have that. So I don't have a good, I don't have a strong conception of like a timeline of how old I was when things happened when I was young. But I, I think that I was around six and we went to a, we went to like a, a community sign language class at the, at like the elementary school library. And it was a, one of those very fun kind of rare opportunities where we could like go and like do something. And so it was like all of the kids from the compound, like we all went out there and we had like this class with this. Uh, in fact, I think it might've just been us. I think my, my family may have like specially arranged it, but it was like this sign language teacher who I don't even know wh- why she was there or why she was in town. It doesn't really like, she was just there. She was doing a class. And during the class, she was talking, she was teaching us the sign for like father, mother, sister, brother, like right? the family signs. And I wanted to ask, I was like, okay, well, I have two moms. So how do I sign my other mother? Right. So the way that I referred to my, 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 there was like my mom. And then there was my other mother who I called mother and then her name. Right. So I won't say her name, but like mother Alice, if, if that was her name. And so I was like, how would I sign mother Alice? Right. How would I say, how would I say my other mother in sign language? And the, the, teacher was kind of like, I don't know, kind of like, kind of like threw her for a loop. And she like, she was like, maybe you would do this. And it was like, it was a good enough answer that I was like, cool, I get it. Like there's a, there, like I, at that point I sort of knew, I was like, this is a bit of a different, but it's not a bad different. It's just, this is who I am. And I'm, I'm asking this question. But then when we got, when we left, I got into big trouble. So I, I got like the, the parents were very angry with me. Because it was like, no, you are not supposed to draw that kind of attention to us. What if she would have, what if she would have asked for more? What if, and this is like back in the early nineties, right? So in early nineties, polygamy is still illegal in Utah. It is, it's illegal in Wyoming. And so there's a really real fear that they, that my parents had, that they were going to be, and they kind of like distilled that, that they were going to be, you know, they'd get in trouble with the law which given what happened later uh, probably should have happened. But like as an adult now, I can kind of see it. And that's one of the tricky things now about, I think the relationship that, that the world of Mormon fundamentalism has with the modern world is that there is real harm happening, right? There is real child abuse. There is real neglect happening in these places, but it's of a nature that it makes it very difficult for us to know exactly how to, how to alleviate it? How do we actually, cause it's, it's happening in a very different way. So I didn't, I didn't attend school. We, we did homeschool. And I say, I like it. I always use air quotes when I say that because it was my mom and like, and my mom uh, is a lovely woman. And I, I, I think she's like, I have a lot of love and care for her, but she also like didn't graduate college and her, her highest level of education has been, you know, a high, high school. And then, and she's been primarily charged with homeschooling most of our, our, in fact, all of the siblings, right? And so I've talked to, I, there are a couple of others who have followed me out and I've talked to all of them and they're like, yeah, we didn't, we had a shitty education. And it was like, an, an example is my, my high school math education was mom handing me an algebra two textbook and saying, go learn algebra. And what I learned is that the answers are in the back of the book. And so now I know algebra. It's actually great. I can, I can solve all the algebra that I need. And so that was kind of like the schooling. But what, what ended up happening is that my parents had this belief that, so they believe in the, the last days, right? The calamities are upon us. And during the last days, when everything is destroyed, uh, the righteous are going to need a place of refuge to gather, right? Which is a pretty, that's a pretty Mormon idea, right? That's not just Mormon polygamous. A lot of Mormons believe, believe stuff like that. And so they believed that their ranch was going to be one of those safe havens. So it was like absolutely essential that they have as much land and as much like as big of a ranch as possible. 
And so they, but the problem was, is that they weren't very good at making money on that ranch and the ranch uh, didn't, wasn't really self-sufficient. And so they started a bakery on the ranch to kind of pay the bills so they could acquire all of this land and like have to basically play cowboy for God. When they started the bakery, it was right on the ranch. And they, the plan was that they were going to be take, making bread and delivering it to like the, the local community. And then also to Yellowstone National Park, because Yellowstone National Park was pretty close. And it was actually a pretty good opportunity because there, like, there was a lot of tourism that, that hit that in, in the 90s. And so they start the bakery. And when they start the bakery, because it's on the property, pretty quick, they, they decide that they don't want to have any Gentiles coming to work in the bakery because they don't want anyone like who would be wicked to come on the ranch to corrupt the youth, right? If we saw someone with like, I don't know, a tank top or like a Nirvana shirt, we might get some ideas. And so they, they're like, we're not going to do any of that. But fortunately there's like this whole crop of children who are all here all the time. And so they had to start working in the bakery. So I started working in the bakery when I was eight and I started working there full time when I was 11. And by the time I was 14, I was basically running the place. Uh, and, and it was pretty brutal work. Like we were, when I say bakery, I think some people have like, like this cute, like mom and pop shop idea in their head. Like they're thinking like, oh, I've been to a great harvest once and that bakery looks kind of fun. Uh, we're talking like cement floors, industrial mixers, industrial ovens, heavy equipment. It was, it was dangerous work and, and we got hurt quite often. That's and I was ask you what, so what, what kind of things were you putting out? I mean, if you're, if you're shipping it to Yellowstone, uh, you're probably fulfilling pretty large orders during the summer season, at least. Totally. Yeah. I mean, we would, we would ship, uh, so we were doing, we would, we made bread, we made granola, we made cookies and we made cinnamon rolls and we would go, I mean, in the height of the summer, we were taking two trips a week through Yellowstone with like a full van of bread, like hundreds of loaves. We would make like in the height of the summer, we would make pro in fact, I can just do the math real quick. We'd make probably a batch was about 150 loaves and we'd make, you know, easily 15 batches in a day. So that's about 2000 loaves. And we would do that twice a week during the summer. So we would, we'd be making about four to 5,000 loaves of bread a week. And we'd be shipping that to the, and by shipping them, what that meant is like, we would put it in our vans and then I would go and drive with my dad. Um, and we would, and when we would go there and deliver it's in the summertime. And so everyone there is like, oh my God, it's so cool that you have your son with you, like on a summer break. And you're like, you know, it's like this fun father thing. And what they don't realize is that I worked 13 hours the day before making all of this bread that I'm going to work. I've already worked 10 hours today. I'm going to work another 15 today, sleep in the van that night, and then do it all over again tomorrow, just in time to go back to the branch and make another bread day on Thursday. And so it's like, there was this veneer of like, oh, isn't it cool that you have your, that you get to like your, your son's here and you're like teaching him the value of work. And, but what's really happening is that I'm being exploited, right? I'm getting paid 25 cents an hour to do hard labor in a bakery that I can't leave if I want to. That's what I want to dig into that a little bit before we go on with your story, because child labor is a huge uh, issue in the state of Utah and in, in Mormon communities. And I think there's this Mormon ethos around hard work anyway. And part of it, mm -hmm. I appreciate, right. You know, I love, I love that I, that I have learned to work hard in my life and that people totally. have as well, but it does come at a cost. I mean, there are reasons that child labor laws have been enacted in this country, but I do think in, in our culture and community, there's this sort of, uh, attitude about it, that it, you know, it was a good thing for us, but yeah. let, let's talk about, talk about some of the injuries, talk about some of the risks that you saw and maybe, um, maybe the hope or dream that you would have had for your childhood, what you could have been doing if you weren't mm. working in a bakery all day. Yeah. Yeah. I love that question. And I, I, I agree that there, that there's a real problem in, in our culture with that. That's one of the reasons why I'm speaking out, why I'm like on TikTok and like the, 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 the thing I like to do is make people laugh. But what I'm really doing is I'm educating people. I'm letting people kind of peek into a world that's been painted 
as like a happy, like nice, fun world. And it's actually very, it, there's a lot of toxicity in there. And just a, a point of that, right, is that like, I'm super grateful that I know how to work hard, but the cost of being labor trafficked, what it means to like your a, a person's soul is that you don't feel like your labor, like your work is for you. And so it's like, the, what, what you lose is sovereignty and choice. And it's taken me the better part of two decades to work through that, to work to a place where I feel like my energy and my being is for me and that I get to take action and to, and to work to make my life better. It's not for someone else. It's not for uh, a cause. It's not me. It's for me. I get to be here. And that's the cost, right? That's like the, the emotional and, and even sometimes the physical cost. What it looked like on the ground is that during the summer, and, and we worked during the winter too, but it was, it was like we would go down to like maybe two days a week that we would work. In the summer, we were working six days a week. And a typical week for me looked like this. On Monday, I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I would go down to the bakery and I would start making bread. And I would make bread until about... 10 o'clock that night. And I would have a couple of breaks in between there. Like I would take a lunch break. I, I would kind of like maybe do a, a couple of other things, but I was working basically from three o'clock until around 10. And then I would go to sleep. And then I would wake up at two o'clock and I would come down to load my dad to, cause he and I were going to go deliver to Yellowstone. So I would load the van while he was sleeping because he was going to drive. So I would load the van and then we would get in the van and we would drive. It was a three hour drive to Yellowstone. I would sleep for part of that. But for part of it, I would also drive because my dad had me start driving when I was 11. Um, That was actually how I learned to drive on on a highway is that he woke me up when I was 11 and said, I can't drive anymore. I'm falling asleep. So I need you to drive as we're like driving to Yellowstone. And so he's like, put the, keep it between the white line and the yellow line and keep it under 50. And I was like, here I go driving on the highway as an 11 year old. Um, And I crushed it. Like it was great. I was a fantastic driver. That was my, that was my Tuesday. And that Tuesday, then we're delivering all day on Tuesday. We'll get back home at like midnight, sometimes one o'clock. And then the next day's Wednesday, Wednesday, we make granola Wednesday. I can get up at a little bit later. I can get up at six o'clock and go make some granola. I'm in the, I'm in the bakery probably until four or five. And then I got to go to bed because Thursday's the big day. Thursday, I'm getting up at two or three. I'm coming down. I'm working bread again. And we're doing bread again until probably 10 o'clock that night. I'm going to bed again. Now I'm waking up at two o'clock the next morning to go download my dad again, because we're going to do a two day delivery to Yellowstone this time. I deliver with him all day on Friday. We sleep in the van in Yellowstone, deliver all day on Saturday. We get back six, seven, eight o'clock on a Saturday. And then we get to go to church. And that is every week of every summer of my entire childhood from the time I was 11 until I was until I left when I was 18. And I want to talk about your church, but I let's talk about what happens if you're a normal kid and getting up at two in the morning is hard for you, or you don't want to do it, or you have a bad day. What, what happened to the kids who struggled with this schedule? Maybe kids that weren't neurotypical or things like that. What, what was that like for them? Do you know? For me, what it was like, I, I don't know. I, I know that it wasn't good for me. And I, I believe that it wasn't good for anyone. One of the reasons I, I started, so I, I, I began kind of a trauma recovery journey about uh, three years ago. And one of the things that sort of pushed me into it was kind of tracking. I, I, I sat down and I wrote out, I was like, what happened? Like what actually happened to me on that, on that compound? And one of them is I, I tracked just like with that schedule thinking about, okay, how much sleep did I lose as a teenager? And I got about a third, I lost about a third of the sleep that I was supposed to have as a, as a teenager. So what that means probably is that my brain got fucked up. Like, I don't know how much, I don't know. I don't know what I could be. I I don't know what I could do if I wasn't that way, but I have, I have massive sleep debt that I'm still trying to pay back. And if, you know, if we like you, you asked the question, like, what if we couldn't handle, like, what if I just didn't feel good? What if I didn't want to wake up that morning? It was like, doesn't really matter. You have to. So I, you would get yelled at you. Like if I slept in and this didn't just happen to me, this happened to you know, anyone, anyone who didn't, you know, do what the family needed, uh, we'd get in trouble. It was like, doesn't really matter. You have to. So I, you would get yelled at, you, like if I slept in and this didn't just happen to me, this happened to, you know, anyone, anyone who didn't, you know, do what the family needed, uh, we'd get in trouble. Like I, I have, I remember like regularly waking up 
to some adult screaming at me because I'd slept in because now it was four o'clock instead of three o'clock. And I was an hour late to the bakery. So let's, let's talk about church. Uh, I think people want to know what church was like for AUB, because I think it would be surprising to mainstream to realize how, how similar your life is, especially, Mm -hmm. but what is polygamous church like? So polygamous church is you all get together for uh, like a sacrament meeting and the sacrament meeting is, it depends on where you're at, but it's like, for us, it was hosted in like one of the members garages. Like that was our our church. And we had like a bunch of chairs, um, like the, the fold out chairs that the Mormons have. We had those, we had, uh, old, uh, LDS hymnals, like the Brown and the blue ones. Although they, the AUB has since published their own hymnal, which is just an absolute doozy. It has some truly awful hymns in it, but we, we, we just sung with out of, out of those, those hymns we had, it was like someone would conduct so there would be a, a priesthood holder at the, at the front. It usually wasn't one difference is like in, in the, in the LDS wards, it's like the Bishop and his counselors, they're sitting up on the stand. And in the, in the AUB where I was at the person who was in charge, the Bishop of the, it wasn't, he wasn't, he was a Bishop, but we weren't really called a ward. We weren't really a, we were just like a group, but he was like the Bishop of the group. And he would ask a priesthood member to conduct for that church day. And then that person would go up and sit and then we would have the sacrament. The sacrament was not blessed by teenagers. It was blessed by uh, adult men. That was one of the things that was, was believed was important is like, you had to be a priest to bless or pass the sacrament. So they didn't have deacons passing. They would just like bless it. And then they pass it. They would do like a loaf of bread and then break it all up rather than like the sliced bread. And that was important because that was one of the ways that the the LDS church had sort of fallen away from the truth is that the LDS church would use sliced bread and they would break it up before they prayed it. And we would pray over it first, which is the right way to do it. And then we would break it up because that was the body of Christ. Right. And then we also had a common cup, which was super fun. So rather than for the, for the water, instead of like a bunch of little, bunch of little like shot glasses, we had like one cup that we all backwashed in. That's nice. Uh, and I'm glad to know that that's the first time I heard that we fell, fell away with our sliced bread. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, yeah. that's the thing about Mormonism, right? Is you never quite know what it is that's going to get you. But in your case, it was sliced bread. Well, as a baker, you would know, you know, the same. I mean, I would. <laughs> I wouldn't know the, the proper way. Um, but so then this was, this is really, the, I think, the main difference. And it, it is that. After all of that, after we did all of that, by the way, when I first, when I first attended an LDS church and on my mom's, my mom's parents, we like went and went to their house and I saw the little shot glasses and I was like, oh my God, that's genius. Like that is so, because it's so gross that we're all drinking out of the same water glass. And, and I told my parents that, and they're like, yeah, but that's not the proper way to do it. Like the righteous way is the way that where we all share spit, which was so gross to me. Um, it was so gross, but, uh, the, after the sacrament, then what would happen is that the person who was conducting would generally give a talk and giving a talk basically meant like you weren't, you didn't prepare giving a talk meant getting up and sort of saying whatever you felt like the spirit wanted you to say. So it was a free for all, like it could literally anything could come out of anyone's mouth and it did. So I think polygamous church is actually far more entertaining (laughs) than the LDS church. Okay, there's so much to unpack, but that's only half. That's only half, almost half of the interview. This was a lot. The child labor, the stuff they had to do as kids. I'm wondering, did Cody's boys... Didn't the older boys get sent off to the ranch to work? The family ranch in Wyoming? Didn't that happen? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm asking. Let me know in the comments below. Meet me down in the comments below. Let me know what you think on this part so far. What you heard. Don't forget, later today, I will have a part two. The second part of this interview very telling. Y'all want to stay tuned for this, so smash that subscribe button. Click the bell beside subscribe to all. I love you for watching. Meet me down in the comments. Like and share. You know, all the YouTube stuff. Okay, I'll see y'all in a little bit.